So, if you calculate a particular particle, you want to calculate its rapidity, the lower one is the formula. You know its energy, you know its longitudinal momentum, so you can calculate by this. But what is the physics? I mean, does it convey anything to you? Well, not really, this formula. But if I write it slightly in a different manner, then you will find that E plus Pz, this thing, you know, what is E? E is the energy of the particle, right? Energy of the particle. Therefore, this E will be mass I do not write, Pt square plus Pz square, right? Now suppose it's a very high transverse momentum phenomenon. Then it means that longitudinal momentum is zero, right? So numerator will basically be approximately equal to the transverse momentum. Denominator will be the same. So it is log 1, that means rapidity is 0. And that immediately gives you a picture. If you look here, so eta equal to 0 region means this is the beam direction. So small rapidity means the momentum of your particle is directed in this way, which means that it is fully transverse to the beam. Therefore, small rapidity region means large transverse momentum. And this is the region where you are mostly interested in new physics. On the other hand, as you increase the rapidity, it is logarithmic increase. So, it is not dramatic. As you come close to the beam pipe, then of course, it is 0. And then you have a singularity in fact because of the denominator. It is zero. You get a negative argument. But you do not have to worry about it because longitudinal momentum <coughs> can never be zero because that. See, I mean the event will have, no, I am sorry, transverse momentum can never be equal to zero because of the beam pipe. See, you have a beam pipe here. So, your particle when it goes down the drain, I do not care about its rapidity. Whatever I can see has a rapidity. So, in the language of the experimentalists, this region where rapidity is fairly large is called the barrel or central region. Can you distinguish it further, Kapoor? Which one is barrel and which yeah. one is central? So barrel is up to 1.5. Okay, so what he is saying is, up to rapidity 1.5 plus or minus, it is the barrel region and the central region is when the rapidity is even less than 1.5 and then end cap means it is almost the, well again there are two regions which is end cap and forward. Basically they are regions of high rapidity but these blocks show that this is a detector coverage. That is, this zoom is the part of the detector which <coughs> takes care of the central region or the barrel region. The yellow part takes care of the forward direction where the rapidity is large, etc., etc. Now, this is just for the sake of completeness that in many cases you will find a definition if you, so that it is useful to know just the definition. Often you will find that instead of rapidity, they use the variable pseudo rapidity. Now that can be easily obtained from this formula by putting the mass of the particle exactly equal to zero. That means when the mass of the particle is exactly zero, then rapidity and pseudo rapidity is the same thing. And you have to do three, four lines of algebra for coming from here to here. But here the angular dependence is direct. That is the rapidity variable is minus log tan theta over 2. Okay. So quite often, because we want high PT phenomena, because the ability of the detector to detect a particle in the 
central region or in the barrel region is good, we want to retain only the signals coming from the end cap and the end cap and the uh, barrel. Right? Not so, end cap, only barrel. No, no. Central and barrel. In the central region and in the barrel region. Central is less than 1.5, barrel is no. Barrel Similar. Let's say. Okay. Eta within plus minus 1. 1.5. If you want to cover barrel and central. Anyway, that's not vitally important. So just to get good events which are detected with better efficiency, you apply a rapidity cut. Now it is again the same thing. As you generate the event, you calculate its rapidity and say if the rapidity is greater than this, <coughs> throw away this event. If the rapidity is less than this, throw away this event. So on and so forth. But some of the regions are, I can tell you one Higgs signal without going into any details. There is one Higgs signal which is tagged by forward moving jets. That is the jets necessarily move in the high rapidity. Forward moving jet means the jet more or less follow the windpipe. Not within the windpipe, then you cannot do anything. So it is important from the experimental point of view to have a good detector functioning in the end cap region also. But that depends on specific physics. For most of the new physics search, we focus on the central and barrel. Alright, so this is the story of the rapidity and then I will just go to one slide to tell you another thing. Now you can say that sir, you say top decaying into, top decaying into electron, antineutrino and no, positron probably, positron, neutrino and B. Now this B quark is also heavy, it's half stable. Why didn't you decay it? Well, depending on what you want to do, it is a good idea to decay it. In terms of integration, you will mean that you will have 10 more variables. 5 for the B decay on this side, 5 for the B bar decay. But that's your integrator's problem, okay? That's the problem of the guy who wrote whether that further 10 dimensions will give you a good result is his problem. You have to generate more events, obviously. But that's not the question. I didn't decay the top on purpose, bottom on purpose. Because, you know, there is a good chance that you can detect the bottom directly. That is, you have a B quark in the event. That does not stop you from detecting its decay products. You can determine the decay products. In fact, you have to determine the decay products. But you can also detect the bottom directly by what is known as B tagging. Now again, this will be completely qualitative. <coughs> you are saying, uh, talking about the J, B jet. Yeah. Well, I mean, at this level, I have not yet talked about jet formation. So let us stick to the B language. The jet formation will be done pictorially. Because there is no way I can do but any. In, I'm just asking. In this case, it will be a jet, right? Of course, right. a B jet. B jet. B will decay, and things will be. If the B B decays leptonically, then I think you know. It is still it, there. It is still you have two tracks, so you can still do what I say. Yeah, it is still a jet, but you can tag the B much better in the lepton. Lepton. Alright, now comes, I think in Fermilab Tevatron, they could do only this muon tagging. The G0 experiment, they only had this muon tagging. A jet containing a mu was regarded as a jet. And the tagging efficiency was 20%. Now we do all no, the results, no, no, no. so 70%. Alright, so what is the physics here? The physics here is very simple. I told you that. Of course, execution is very difficult as you know, but the physics is very simple. 
So I said that W decays into something with a lifetime, average lifetime 10 to the minus 24, 25. So I said forget about it. Even if it travels with speed of light, which it often doesn't, you just, you know, its track will be too small. There's no way you can do anything like that. Pi or mu on the other hand has typical decay time of a few, a fraction of a micrometer. It could be one tenth, it could be one hundredth. Moreover, it is boosted, its lifetime is boosted. So therefore it will decay, it is a much longer decay length and its lifetime is dilated so it will travel a lot. Therefore, it decays outside the detector. There is no way you can detect a decay. Pi zero you can because it is electromagnetic decay and its lifetime is not that great. So, pi zero decays and you detect not the pi zero but the two photons that mostly come from the pi zero. But there are some intermediate guys whose lifetime is of the order of a few picoseconds 10 to the minus 12. And they are detectable in the sense that you can see their track. For muon also, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Muon decays in the muon chamber. No, but you can see the track. Well, it, it even passes through the muon chamber. Because the Lorentz boost is there. But you can measure its properties very well. Of course. Of because course. you have a nice track. With, uh, Long track. No, you have tracker information, you have mayon chamber information, putting everything together you can detect. We don't mind whether it is decaying or not as long as we can measure its properties, right? Yeah, except that you cannot measure it. Huh? You cannot measure it if it decays, right? You cannot have it sent back. If decay products are also confined, then maybe you know I can deconstruct the everything. I want everything is confined basically. If something is going out, then I don't have any hand. No, so what you are saying is if for the muon you had both the tracker information right. and both the muon chamber information, then you can, re yes, this is how they detect a muon. Right. This is how they detect a muon. It does not matter whether it decayed or not. Muon detection is relatively easier, right, out of all the particles. This so is that I don't know. It's not relatively easier, the same is designed to make it better. Compact muon, sorry, Atlas, sorry, no, Atlas, sorry name. Atlas muon detection is much more complicated. Alright, so our interest in these intermediate guys who have small lifetime but just enough to give you a track in the, uh, you, you, within the detector which you can measure and as I told you I will just give you a picture, nothing more and the picture is the following, suppose this is the interaction vertex which is also called the primary vertex bar interaction with this here and suppose this is your B quark then the B quark will be decaying elsewhere that is this separation this is measurable which you cannot do in the case of W or top or Higgs for that matter those guys are far too small now if this fellow decays into at least two visible tracks then you can produce them backward and you can find out the BTK vertex. And then roughly speaking, if you can calculate the decay length, then you can identify this as a deep work. In reality, of course, the impact parameter is a much better information, which is geometrically defined in this fashion. But that's matter of detail. So you can, in fact, detect directly and this becomes very hand, handy when for example you wish to reject the QCD background for any signal which has a deep work in it because QCD background will very little deep work in it normally. It can only come from a gluon spitting into BB bar but this gluon spitting is of probability 
relatively small. So suppose you don't have to talk about any specific signal. Think of a signal which has at least one V quad in it. Now there will be a corresponding QCD background that is light quarks produced in PP collision. That cross section will be huge. So typically you will have huge number of QCD background corresponding to this. Then this B tagging becomes very handy. You say that if the event does not have a B quark in it, throw it out. This is again like a cut. You say that if this event does not have a B quark, which is detected by this B tagging, throw it away. Then most of the signal will be retained because it has indeed a B quark and as Arun was saying that nowadays the B tagging probability is 80 percent or something. So most of the signal will be retained but most of the background will be retained. So this is the story of B tagging which is also a very useful selection criteria for rejecting the background. But B tagging is also very difficult. No. Right? The, the, the as he is saying 80%. 80 percent. If it is no, difficult, how it can be? No, 80 percent have achieved. Yes. yes. Depends on the what uh, uh, we send meters on you want to use. For example, we have currently most of the analysis you say was going to be around 70 percent, only 1 percent which are improving probability for the light years. And for the C then, then everything is under control. Well, Yes, but the trouble is still most of the signal cross section is still too small. That's why you have only limits. <laughs> Nothing. With all this control, you still don't see any new signal. So whatever is there must be having a fantastically small cross section. Well, not really. I mean, sometimes you have the so-called compressed cross section, which means that the particles which are produced have their mass roughly degenerate with each other. Then the mother will decay into a daughter which has roughly the same mass. And therefore energy release will be small. And therefore all the particles you measure, suppose the dark matter particle is roughly degenerate with its mother. Okay. Suppose, then you will never see the dark matter event because the visible particles will have very less energy. Very less. But people are smart. Then they still have this, I am not going into the details, but still they have a monojet plus missing energy signature, which means that dark matter, complex particle, you see nothing. But you radiate a jet from one of the initial particles, that will be a high PTJ. Missing will, energy will be large because you have missed everything. So extremely high missing energy plus one jet can be a dark matter signal, except that in this case you will never tell which dark matter is this, whether it is dark matter of theory A, whether it is dark matter of theory B, because from theory A, B you have seen nothing, no. except for missing energy, right? Then if some smart guy can use some variable which will be sensitive to the dark matter mass, let the spectrum be complex but the variable itself is sensitive to the dark matter mass, maybe. Anyway, so I think I am more or less here uh, uh, at the end. The only thing I wanted to show you now is, is the real thing. Well, I have to admit that whatever I did is something like this. Whatever be the process, a top part is produced and then it decays. So normally this kind of thing which are produced by two high energy partons from the proton will be referred to as the hard process. By hard we simply mean that the PT spectrum will be hard or PT, average PT will be large in the event. So that is a hard. But what do I see in practice? See, in practice you are seeing a proton-proton collision, right? Not for. Now by inventing the pattern model, you can calculate, you can make a reasonable calculation. But that does not mean